Another little uh, fact that I don't think people know, you were a diver and you, uh, which is kind of fitting, this can be a bad pun, but you were lit on fire, which seems like it's been your job the past. <laughs> the pa I read this, by the way. So right. tell us about that background. <laughs> what sort of weird ritual does NAR make you go through to become president? They lit you yeah. on fire? I was a diver. And so what do you do with those skills in the summertime? You work at the uh, local amusement park in a, in a stunt and high dive show. So I used to do high dives from 75 feet. I used to get lit on fire and paid for it. You're never quite prepared for the first time you get lit on fire. But what it taught me is, <laughs> is not to panic. On this episode of Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered, we talk about the NAR settlement, why they settled versus appeal. We went deep on the lending industry, the changes that need to happen here. We talked a lot about NAR's communications. It's going to be an incredible show. Tune in. You talk about it privately. We talk about it publicly. This is the Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered podcast. Welcome again to the Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered Podcast. I'm your host, James Dwiggins, along with my co-host, Mr. Crazy Uncle Keith, also known as Keith Robinson. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Robinson, we mm. uh, got to have the president of the National Association of Realtors uh, come on the show in yep. an unfiltered format as much as he can do, yep. um, but it was a great conversation. Tell everybody about what we talked about. Yeah, we talked about a bunch. He talked about uh, getting lit on fire. No, that wasn't the day he accepted the job. As although president. relevant. <laughs> yes, although relevant. Uh, he talked about his lifetime of service to the industry. We talked about NARS communications. Uh, we went pretty deep on that and gave our opinions and thoughts. Make sure you tune in for that part. Why did NARS settle after telling us they'd fight to the death, that VA and mortgage and how that could be a solution for this and what NAR is doing on that front, and then his vision for the future of NAR. It was a really good show, and we appreciate the candor. So tune in. Same. It's going to be amazing. Yep. Put it in yours, kids. Kevin, welcome to the show. Uh, I know I speak for all of our viewers and listeners that we are excited to have you. Um, it has been uh, certainly an interesting ride <laughs> for, uh, for some time. Um, uh, we have a lot to cover today, and, and we really do appreciate you being here. I, I know, and Keith knows, how much travel you're doing and just <laughs> the amount of calls and emails and, and stuff that you're working through. So we do appreciate you giving us some of your time. I, I thought it would be interesting for just to start real quick, just to give everybody just a little bit of, of your background, just so they have a little bit of context on, you know, you've been in the industry and how you got to be president. Uh, just all of those things I think would be good for everybody to start with. And then we'll dive into all of the questions that we have, because there's no shortage of there's stuff going in on. residential real estate today. There's nothing going so, on. I don't know what we would talk about for yeah. a few minutes, but we'll try. Yeah. But let's start with you. So give us a little bit of background on your on yourself and you know your career and all of that stuff. Uh, James Keith, thank you. I appreciate being uh, on the podcast, and I can't wait to get to the unfiltered part with you guys. Uh, but <laughs> don't you, you know, worry. <laughs> <it's>, yeah. <laughs> so, but what what uh, what uh, I love being able to tell people is I've been in real estate since uh, 1971, uh, licensed since 94. Uh, I'm a second generation uh, realtor and broker. And the first thing that my father said to me in 94 when I passed the licensing exam in Massachusetts was, grab your checkbook, go to the local association, fill out the application, pay your dues and join three committees. And who would have thought that, that 30 huh. years later, I'd be uh, sitting here as the president of the National Association of Realtors. And what I'll tell you, my involvement at the local association of realtors um, led to me being involved at the state association of the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. And I served as president of the Massachusetts Association in 2010. Um, my involvement with the National Association began in 1998 when I first became a federal political coordinator, an FPC, for Congressman Richie Neal. Um, he is still our congressman. Uh, I'm no longer the FPC. I can't uh, uh, fulfill th those duties while I'm an officer. Uh, but he uh, most recently was uh, chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, one of the most important committees for our industry. And so he's now the ranking member. And I've had a couple of meetings with him uh, so far this year. But um, my first committee assignment was 2003. My first leadership position with NAR was 2011. And since then, I've chaired multiple committees. I served as a vice president of government affairs. I served as a presidential liaison. Um, and then in, in May of 22, 
um, the directors uh, elected me to serve as first vice president in uh, in 23. So um, I'm not going to go through all the stuff, but yeah. just know that, that I've served <laughs> on, on uh, multiple committees, uh, chaired multiple uh, work groups, PAGs, all that stuff. And, and so just been uh, a wonderful opportunity to serve the association and the members. So uh, there's another little uh, fact that I don't think people know. You were a diver and you, uh, which is kind of fitting, this can be a bad pun, but you were lit on fire, which seems like it's been your job in the past. <laughs> The pa I read yeah. this, by the way. So right. tell us about that yeah. background. What yeah. sort of weird so I, ritual does NAR make you go through to become president? They lit you yeah. on fire. No, so I was uh, I was a, an athlete, a high school multi sport athlete in college. I focused on one, and I, I actually was a Division One scholarship athlete. I was a diver, and so what do you do with those skills in the summertime? You work at the uh, local amusement park in a in a stunt and high dive show. So I used to do high dives from seventy five feet. I used to get lit on fire and paid for it, um, you know. And and one of the things that and when I, I talk to people about my experience um, in that stunt and high dive show. Um, you know, diving from 75 feet, being lit on fire. It's um, one of the things that, that I, I learned through that is um, <laughs> practice and repetition means a, a great deal. Trusting in fundamentals means a great deal. And um, you're never quite prepared for the first time you get lit on fire. But what it taught me is <laughs> is not to panic, Yeah, not to panic. And so that's, that skill set, I think, has served <clears throat> me very well in my leadership journey. Sure. It's it's trust your fundamentals, gather as much information as you can, um, <laughs> and 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 don't panic uh, because when when you panic, when you make rash decisions, you typically have rash consequences, rash results. And so uh, I, I do my best to be very thoughtful, diligent, um, and then you know once you get all the information, it's it's uh, figure out the solution or solutions, and then implement the plan. And um, that's that's kind of my mantra as I, I go through this. Well, it's actually a really good comment just because I obviously was making a pun out of that. But, you know, you, it did ironically prepare you for coming into a role with obviously a lot of crisis, which, you you know, when you were going up the ranks, <laughs> you never probably planned to be <laughs> yeah. in this position having to deal with with, you know, all of the, the drama that's in our industry right now. I want to ask a question before we go a little bit further on that, because you were talking about you know, all these roles in the, and just working with politicians and stuff. It, I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what my question is, except you, it seems like there's been, there's a lot of structure at NAR and I don't, and, and it gets criticized in some ways, but it also seems to me that there's a reason why these structures exist because you're working within a system that has been that is already designed, meaning like how there are different committees in Congress and you have to create, I'm assuming committees that work with those committees and, you know, how do you lobby with or influence politicians and educate them? So I, I guess, I guess the question is that this has taken a long time. NER has been around for a very long time and is structured something that works within the current system. Are there changes that need to occur with this or, or is it, I mean, cause you, meaning like if, if we change the whole structure of NER, is it going to have an adverse effect on the way the United States current system operates? Does that, does that, a, so, does that make sense? So the I question actually, I'm asking. I like, I like the analogy that you have there, James. And, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll fine tune it for you. Um, okay. The committee structure that we have at, at NAR would be similar to the house of representatives, Congress, right? Okay. And, and a lot of work gets done there. Then it gets passed up to the Senate. And so maybe the board of directors is the Senate and they're more deliberate and they take things slower. Um, and, and typically that's a good thing. Um, because like I said earlier, you know, you don't want to do, um, make rash decisions, you know, uh, impulse decisions. And that was, the, that's what the Senate does. There, that's the checks and ball balance in, in Congress. Um, but what, with regards to the structure, yeah, the structure has been around a, a long time and, um, a few years ago, uh, we finished up a three-year PAG presidential advisory group looking at our structure. And the question was, what do we need to do to carry our association forward? Do we need to make any structure changes? Um, there were uh, a lot of um, recommendations made and some changes implemented. And I think probably one of the most important ones is that um, the executive committee, which has grown a little bit, there's about 75 or so uh, realtors from across the country that are on the executive committee have more authority to um, operate the association, make decisions quicker than the 
the board of directors. So they can meet between board of directors meetings. The board of directors still um, controls the budget. Um, they handle the elections. Any bylaws changes or changes to the Constitution and um, uh, code of ethics changes they have. But um, the other stuff, they've given some of the authority to the executive committee to be able to act um, in their place. So okay. I, I think that has helped to streamline some things. The new system, this year is the very first year for that new system to be fully implemented. Um, but yeah, I, I think time will tell. Are there other changes that, that need to happen or are going to happen? That's for uh, the membership to, to decide to, to let us know, to give us their, uh, uh, their information, their input. Uh, but but right now, I think um, we're going to give uh, this system a little bit of a chance to see if if we can uh, if it will make a difference for us. That's a really good lead into the the first question that I wanted to ask is you know obviously it's been a, a whirlwind, <laughs> um, you know two two presidents before you have resigned, um, you step in not in an I'm I'm assuming not an ideal way to start. Um, and certainly a lot of problems that you're, you're facing. So it, how long have you, you've been president now for since, since January when? 8th? Okay. So it's coming up on three months. Okay. So what, what is in those, wow, in those three months, um, <laughs> what, what are some of the changes that you're already enacting or that you want to see? Because I, your term is longer, correct? Because of, uh, you have, uh, is it almost yeah. two years then? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll be um, uh, installed as president in Boston for 2025. I guess reinstalled, um, <laughs> and so then uh, I'll be uh, president in 25. But you know, I mean, with regards to to what's happened, uh, what I'll tell you, James, in the fall um, after the first resignation, I traveled around and having conversations with the members, just trying to to calm uh, things down, calm some fears and explain what we were doing with setting up of the Culture Transformation Commission and uh, the different things we were looking at. Obviously, last fall, uh, we had the, the verdict come out. I, I know we'll be talking about that, um, yeah. <laughs> which, which was uh, just another thing. But what I would say to, the, to the, the members was, the directors elected me for a reason. I didn't know what the reason was at the time I was elected. But last fall, I thought I was trying to figure out what the reason was. Um, mm. And then this January comes and, and uh, all of a sudden I'm, I'm president. And so, but what I'll tell you, because your question was, what's what's happened in that time? Yeah. Um, you know, there there was a concern that I had last fall, and I know you had the concern as well, that there was a void or a vacuum in communications. And when there's a, a, a void, it gets filled. And it's not always filled right. with, um, uh, with truth. The message you want. <laughs> the message we want, right. And so one of the things I asked the senior leadership, I said, we need to do a better job communicating with not only our members, but with consumers, with the media, um, and with interested parties. Um, and so uh, we've, we've ramped up that communications effort. And, and actually, thanks to you, uh, James, I, uh, I started something that's being uh, known as uh, on the road uh, videos where every few weeks I'm having a conversation with members, just letting them know what, what I'm up to, what the association up to, giving a little bit of an update and telling them what to expect. And so hopefully that's resonating, but we're also ramping up our communications and other efforts. Now, uh, I want to talk about the media and then uh, NAR itself. The media, uh, we've, we've ramped up our efforts we have, unfortunately. Um, we cannot control what the media will actually print. <laughs> right. We can give them information, um, but if they already have the narrative or the story written, they're going to find what they need to, to fill um, to fill their column. So that's been yeah. frustrating. And I know we'll probably get into that a little bit more later. Uh, but with regards to NAR itself, within uh, a week or 10 days of being president, um, uh, our interim CEO, Nakia Wright, gave me the opportunity to address um, our staff. Uh, and, you know, 350 staff between the D.C. Uh, and uh, Chicago offices. And there are a couple of things that, that I talked about with them. And, uh, and I think I might have said this when I was with you in Vegas. And, you know, it's when, when we find ourselves in a rut or a slump, um, the, the first thing we need to do is just stop, uh, settle down, and then get back to basics, get back to the fundamentals. So now I'm going to mm -hmm. talk, not diving, I'm going to talk about baseball here. Baseball, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're in a, in a hitting slump, what do you do? You shorten your swing, you shorten your step, you, you choke up a little bit, and, and, and you, you're just trying to make contact. Before you know it, you'll be hitting some line drives up the middle because you're focusing on the fundamentals. You're not swinging for the fences. And so I, I, I said to the members, I, or the staff, I said, listen, 
Um, I'm not one for themes. If I were, it would be do your job because I'm a Patriots season ticket holder, and that was Bill Belichick's uh, <laughs> mantra during the, uh, the, 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 the dynasty. But um, I'm also not one for singular presidential initiatives. And so it's let's have the staff get back to basics, focus on the fundamentals, um, and, and, and drive towards the core mission of our association, which I believe is to make our members more successful. Because mm -hmm. if we make our members more successful, we're going to be able to serve the consumer even better. So I, I just wanted to, to, to clear out um, all of the uh, uh, extra stuff and empower staff. Do your job. Do it well. Mm -hmm. Help the members be successful. And at the end of the day, um, I, I think that's really resonated with staff at all levels of the association, national, state, and local. Um, and, and I truly believe that that's making a difference, um, in where staff is at. And it had been a few months. I actually did a staff huddle with Nakia the other day, um, just to check in after the settlement and to, to let them know what, what our thoughts were and what our plan was just so they could hear it from the leadership. I'm not their boss. Nakia is, but right. we're partners. I've always viewed staff as a partnership. So is there, is there, um, is is there a, some sort of process now to help um, help the staff and the volunteer uh, the volunteers in NER, which everybody obviously is, other than NER staff, um, understand the separation of roles and duties? Meaning, you're so, a volunteer; these are not people yeah. that work for you, yeah. um, and 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 there's more of a protection in that process so, so 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 two things you know i think about the the golden rule you know treat others as you want to be treated right mm -hmm. or something something i say to my kids um and they're adults now but I, i'd say to them as they're growing up it doesn't cost anything to be nice mm, you know right be nice right so but the the second thing is and that's just that's just me and, and the way my mind goes second have thing you is been, the have you been looking at the comment section lately people aren't always nice i just <laughs> thought we should say. <laughs> So the, the the short answer is not really. I have other trusted <laughs> folks, and uh, you know that good. I know that will look Don't at that there. for good. me. Good. Don't go there. It. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Well, and, good and I learned I learned that I learned that from when I ran for city council in two thousand and three. My, my <laughs> yeah. wife got, my wife would go down that rabbit hole, and and it's like no, stick to stick to yeah. what you know in your message. Try but, being yeah. married to a news reporter, okay, and like never read the comments, <laughs> like yeah. ever. Yeah. Keyboard warriors really. is what we call them. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. To, to get back to the relationship between uh, staff and the volunteer, the Culture Transformation Commission, which is really hitting their stride now, and and we think that we're going to be getting some recommendations from them in the coming months. Um, you know, they they really looked at that and they said, how can we make it so that it's a a safe and productive workplace, both for staff and volunteers and together. So um, we're definitely looking at that, taking input from you know best practices uh, from. Uh, all uh, folks involved because there are three verticals in the culture transformation commission. One are the realtor volunteers. One is the NAR staff. And then the other vertical is state and local staff. And so uh, we've got some bright minds in there. And I know that we're going to have some good recommendations to be able to put up the safety rails, the guardrails so that it can be a productive uh, work relationship um, and which will serve the association in the long run. All right, I have well, a I think non Technical yeah, go question. Ahead. Go ahead. If, if you want no, to follow up with that. All I right. do, but you can ask no, go the ahead, question. Because mine's going to take just, us a little far field. I just wanted to, I, I feel like, I think it's, first of all, that's, that's great to hear. I think that's important to do. A lot of that just comes from leadership stance on things. And I think that that is, I think if this, if you're, if the NAR team knows that the leadership team has their back, that's going to increase morale in itself. Like as an example, everybody in our organization would know that if you did anything to our staff, Keith would take you to the parking lot and it would be ended very quickly. I would not um, take his, them. his would... motto is trial by combat, but <laughs> the, all joking aside, the point more than anything is no one in our organization would ever even broach that because the, they understand where leadership's position is on it. And I think that's a really good opportunity for NER to shift um, to shift that with Nakia and you and others who are obviously making that a priority. A lot of it's just people knowing that there's somebody there to support them mm -hmm. and, well, and it yeah, just changes James, morale. So, yeah. so, and that's, that's one of the things is, as I said, empowering, uh, I'm empowering staff to do their job. It's their job yeah. to do it, not mine. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, with, 
um, with the settlement, with uh, what we're expecting to come down from. Well, I don't know what's exactly going to come down from the Culture Transformation Commission. We've gotten some updates, but I don't know what their exact recommendations are going to be. And then you, you mentioned Nakia. So um, we, as I said earlier this week, I did a, a, the staff huddle and I announced to staff, and I'll, I'll just uh, announce it here. Um, before we settled, um, probably in mid-February, I had a conversation with Nakia, and she's interim. She came in short term. That's what we were expecting. And I said, Nakia, I said, there's still some stuff that we need to get done, and I'd like you to be part of it. How long can we have you for, right? Mm -hmm. And she says, Kevin, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question because I was thinking that, but I didn't want to ask you because I thought it would be self-serving. So I talked with the leadership <clears> team, and the leadership team and I, we asked Nakia if she would stay through the end of the year, and she agreed. So we've extended her contract through the end of the year, which will allow us the dust to settle for the settlement for the Culture Transformation Commission recommendations that come in. And it will also allow us to then take our time, do our due diligence to find her permanent replacement. And, mm -hmm. and I think that will add stability for membership, for staff, for the association in that we don't have to worry about having multiple presidents recently, multiple CEOs <laughs> recently. And, and so... I think that that staff is is um, despite uh, some nerves based on the settlement, rightfully so because you yeah, know, we everybody need to is communicate sure. with them. Yeah, but you yeah. know, it's we're going to have some stability, and and I think that uh, at the end of the day is going to be a good thing for us. Keith, you want to jump in? I do. So yeah, yeah, my question. question. No, it's a non-technical question. My question is actually about you. So you get this phone call or an email. I assume it's a phone call at some point where you're, you know you're going to get tapped to to be the the next one in line after all of this stuff. What's your feeling in that moment when you realize that the the roles the reins are about to be handed to you? So, uh, okay, this is unfiltered. So the, yeah. the, the night, the night before I, I said to my wife, we're going to bed. I said, I'm going to bed president elect. There's a chance tomorrow I'll, I'll be president. She's like, what? So during the day, um, she, uh, she reaches out to me. She didn't have to work that day. And she says, how are you feeling? I said, right now, I just don't know if I'm going to vomit or <laughs> <laughs> have an accident in my pants you know i'm yeah, not going to be yeah. and and so she 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 was running air and she came over to the office uh to to see me but it was what it was it was it was the anticipation the nerves mm. of of it right but as soon as it was nope it's official okay now there's a job to do yeah and and this is where okay. the athletics uh you know background helps when one man goes down person when one person goes down on the field <laughs> the next person has to to step in and do the job and yeah. so my men, my mentality, it just shifted instantly. Okay. Now mm. there's stuff that has to get done. So, there's, um, there's, but, yeah, real, it, um, there's yeah. power in the clarity of purpose, right? Like yes. all of the wondering thinking goes away and now it's, yeah. it's, there's clarity of purpose. Yeah. That, yeah. that must've been a sleepless night. I'm sure. <laughs> but, but I, I can mean, only but, imagine, but, but what I'll tell you, and, and James, you asked the question, it's, um, my goal uh, in all of this is that is that it's going to be a much longer runway uh, f for me as president, but to be able to navigate us through the things and and you know let the dust settle behind us because I'm always a lookout at the hor horizon kind of guy. Doesn't matter the stormy seas we're in. What is the horizon saying? And and I am um, uh, encouraged by where I think we can get to through all of this. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'll piggyback a couple of things. First of all, um, I, I, I genuinely mean this because I, I don't sugarcoat stuff. I think you're the right guy for the job right now. Um, and it's, it's what I, what I've been, what I actually appreciate is you, you and I, you and I start, we met a long time ago, long time ago, but our first conversation was after I was very critical, not of you, but of the video that you, that was posted by NAR about, we have got to just get more real. Like we cannot be so scripted. Um, and then you and I chatted on the phone and had a, a really good conversation about, you know, that there, the membership is dying for someone to be in their corner, like just to, to hear what's happening, boots on the ground. And, and, you know, to the comment you made, you have started changing all of that and you have been more just turn your phone around and post posting stuff. And anybody who's not following Kevin should, cause you get to see more real time updates. Um, and I, that's a, that's a lead into my, my question of the NAR comms has been 
I think we can all agree struggling to some degree or another. Um, and I, I really would love to know like what, what is being worked on there. And, and I'm going to preface that with, it feels like we're always on defense instead yeah. of on offense. And in my friend here who I box with, which you never want to do, um, you know, like when are, I want to, I want to see us throw some punches instead of constantly just getting yeah. <laughs> punched in the face. And I, I just, is there a plan around comms to, to the media has been just crushing us with so much inaccurate information. It's been just exhausting. Um, so, so, okay. So I, I get your question. And, and the first thing yeah. I'll say is good defense. Wins and that's not meant to be critical, but no, just no, no. like, I know. Yeah, like good, good defense wins championships. Let's remember that. Okay. <laughs> now, it is good to be on the offensive now and then. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Anthony Lamacchi, he's pleading with us to, you know, to take the gloves off. But um, <laughs> yeah. So, but what I'll tell you, the comms, and I talked about the vacuum, the void that we had in the fall. We did not have um, a, a comms director. And and since that time, Susan Bohia has been hired. She's our, our senior vice president uh, overseeing the communications department. She's got decades of experience. I'm really impressed with with her, with what she's doing. Um, unfortunately, when you're new, you have to get to know everything right before you can really um, get the get the plan going. But but she came in in the middle of um, uh, the. Uh, the chaos of the fall and, and winter. Um, and she's really turning her team around, uh, giving them clarity of, of purpose and, um, and objectives. And we are developing comms plans. Now, the comms plans can be derailed when um, other sides uh, undermine, uh, undermine them. And, uh, and, and I might as well just say now, maybe it'll come up later. We had a comms plan for the settlement. We had um, uh, uh, an embargoed press release, which um, our uh, based on the timing of of the settlement. You know, these are these are typical things, and yeah, uh, and we were we were um, uh, abiding by what was agreed to in the settlement. And lo and behold, um, and if and I, James, I know you read the settlement. It was till mm -hmm. until ten a.m. Eastern time on March 15th, the Ides of March, mind you. Um, yeah. And the New York Times published uh, an article nearly an hour before that quoting the plaintiffs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the New York Times has an agenda? No way. <laughs> and, and so, and so, so here, here's yeah. the problem then. So not only did they get the story wrong, I yeah. mean, there were just so many inaccuracies that yeah. um, other media outlets said, well, the New York Times, you know, they only print, print the news that's fit to print or something fit like that, print, right? Yeah. 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 And and so there's, they, they ran with that rather than, than checking and verifying. They said, if the New York Times printed it, they must be right. So the, the comms plan we had, we had to call an audible. And, and so that put us on the defensive. And what, yeah. what do we do? Um, we've met with, um, we've had sessions where we've had over 100 journalists where we're giving them accurate information. Um, but anytime there's corrections, you don't get the front page. Um, yeah. Like the original story, you're on the 12th page in the bottom corner. If that. Yeah. yeah. So if they I run just, a correction. Yeah. I yeah. just would, I just think that, I just think there's an opportunity, and it's just one man's opinion, by the way, but I just think that there's an opportunity for us to, we're playing chess here, and the lawyers on the other end aren't playing by the same rules. And we have to, we have to think a few moves ahead, knowing that they're going to, they're going to leak it to the New York times or whatever specifically happened. Um, and it, to me, it's, this is just, and I'm just, again, throwing this out there, but to me, it's like, we need to be thinking about, okay, what is the next three moves they're going to make? And how do we get ahead of that? Um, how do we, how do we use opportunities to, get the membership behind it. I think there's a great, I think there's a huge opportunity right now, Kevin, to get, to give the messaging to 1.5 million realtors and let them go be surrogates and let them run around and share content and social media campaigns. And I just, I'm throwing that out there because they're dying to counter this obvious agenda by mainstream media. It's not even like no one's even hiding it anymore. Um, yeah. So, so we are, so two things. One, we are, we are doing high level strategy. We're, we are playing chess and we're looking, okay, we're, um, 
Uh, what was Wayne Gretzky? I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where uh, it's going to be. So we are looking mm. at some of that stuff. Okay. Um, uh, but the the second point is with regards to the surrogates, we, we're developing a list. We've ha- had one meeting. We've got another meeting this week. We've got over 200 realtors across the country, and we're looking for others to self-identify saying we want to be these folks. So here's one of the things that I'll tell you. Uh, the the national media, it's been a pain in, in our rear because of the inaccuracies um, and, and what they've reported. But I'm more concerned about the local media. I need to make mm. sure the local media contacts their trusted uh, real estate professional, Agreed. hopefully a realtor, in their local market to, to give them the true version of the story. Um, because that's where our grassroots where we can win this. Um, yeah. and if it's a war or a battle, we can win it with our grassroots. And so to your point, yeah, we need more folks. And I hope that people on uh, on this podcast, uh, you know, that list, are listening to this will say, you know what, I want to help. Um, and they'll reach out to us at, at NAR. And James, what I'll do is I'll make sure to get you the info that you can share with, um, with your, your watchers, your listeners uh, about who they can contact um, at at NAR, but for me I, right now, I'll just say it. He might not be happy. Mantill Williams, so it's M Williams at NAR dot Realtor. Um, he'd be the first point of contact for me. There might be somebody on his staff that he's going to pass it off to. But <laughs> yeah, uh, so that Mantil, email is now forwarding to Kevin yeah. Sears' uh, yeah. email yeah. address. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Mantil, um, I apologize in advance, but it'll be a great problem for us to have if we can get another 100, 200, 500 folks that are willing to be surrogates to, to help spread the truth about um, what is going on. And, and one last comment on that. And Keith, I know you've got some stuff here too, is I, I, uh, I think there's, we've always focused Keith and I on what we call the humans um, over the, over houses is like a big thing we're about. And I think there's a really interesting opportunity for us to get grassroots, which is what you're focused on. I think it's great of having realtors share stories from their clients about how they wouldn't have gotten their house had they not had representation about how the, these, and there, there are tens of thousands of them that we could get uh, uh, to, to help counter this on a local basis. So trying to figure out how we deploy what I call the troops and give them a task and give them an opportunity. Maybe it's even, you know, people do some great recordings with their clients and those end up being national TV commercials or something like a way to do a campaign around it would be, I just think there's an opportunity for us to think beyond how do we get our local associations involved, but let's get the 1.5 million members to get out there and, and have a voice. Um, we all so, have a huge so James, amount of time. When, but when you were saying that, I was thinking about the old publisher's clearinghouse commercials yeah. where, the, where they show up with the balloons and the big check yeah, and ring the door and, they, and, you, and you get the, you get that honest, raw, real reaction. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, I, I, that's I, what I, resonates I with people. Yeah. It's, it's somebody seeing a, a veteran that, you know, just got their first house. And, you know, uh, I think if we have a, we have a, I know a broker personally who works in the military and she's just, that's what she does. And mm-hmm. th- those are the stories that you capture and it's going to change the heart and some hearts and minds. And I just think that the people are dying to people don't believe the news media anyway, but just countering that with actual stories will drown out the articles that are completely biased. And there's something there for us to think about. Keith, did you want to follow up on that before well, just I- the, the net effect, the human beings who buy and sell houses have overwhelmingly communicated that they've enjoyed the experience and yeah. find and find yeah. that their real estate professional is necessary, right? Like I couldn't imagine doing this without them. And that's a story that we can tell in many, you know, as many millions of transactions as there are a year, there's a story for every single one of those, some great, some small, some, you know, could be a made for TV movie and some are more mundane or, or have to do with sadness and closure and closing a chapter of the life that really hurt. And those stories are what we do as an industry, right? Those yeah. humans and those stories are what we do. So, and then the only other piece, I guess, if we, we're Keith and James get to give you our opinion section of this podcast, but <laughs> it is, um, I get, you can't control what other people will do, but you can control what we do as an industry. And, in upping and you were trying and I'm seeing the change in difference and I commend and applaud you for that. Please continue to fight the good fight. But it's that communication to the 1.5 million members that you can, you have absolute control over that. Right. And, and that's where the biggest comments that I hear is that's where they're, they feel the void. Right. And, yeah. and to your point, like if you don't, 
give it something to talk about, it will create its own thing to talk about, which is often not what you wanted. So I I know you're already working on this and thank you for that. But just want to encourage you, if you need someone to give you a a pat on the back or send you a bottle of whiskey to continue to fight the good fight, you let me know. I'll send it because we need it a a lot. And and, and here ends the opinion part of the show. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yes. Um, Uh, Let's do let's combine two of these, Keith. Um to, to to sort of into one. So I would love for you to talk about the settlement. Um, you know, I know why it's a win, and I'm for the most part in that camp as well. And we'll go through that and I'll, I'll piggyback these together. For a while, NER was talking about um appealing the decision. Um, you know, and then you guys settled. So what changed? Let's combine those yeah. into one. So talking about so- it and then the change in approach. Yeah, so I'll talk about the settlement. Um, and James, the, the word win is your word, okay? So um, the, the, the settlement um, where, if I can say it's it's a good thing for us, it's because if the judge approves it in a, roughly six months or so, then it means it's behind us. And that's, that's where um, we can measure the success, is that it's in our rearview mirror. Um, but ultimately, with the settlement, um, you know, we, we were able to protect well over uh, a million of our members, um, tens of thousands of, of small brokerages, all associations at the local state territory level and all association owned MLSs. Now, uh, there were some carve outs. Um, one of our co-defendants, uh, Berkshire Hathaway and all of their affiliated businesses, they were carved out because they're still defendant in the, in the original case. Um, uh, unfortunately, there were some corporate carve outs as well. Uh, corporate entities, brokerages that had over 2 billion in sales in, in 2022. It's um, roughly 90 to a hundred of those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now yeah. all of their agents, their members are protected in our settlement. It's just the corporate entity that was carved out. Um, and the, the, the plaintiffs, they, they looked at it and, and said, we can have another payday. Um, and in the settlement, there are some options that were worked into the settlement, but these brokerages and the options are, there's a, a flat formula that can be used. There's a, a non-binding mediation that can be used, or the um, brokerages can negotiate on their own, or they can say, we don't want any of it. And you know they have to look at what their risk tolerance is. Um, and if they decide to enter into settlement talks, it's an insurance premium that, that they're pr- paying, uh, unfortunately. Um, but in the settlement, there, there's two key pieces to the settlement. One is financial, the other is rules. And uh, on the financial, uh, the NAR has agreed to pay $418 million uh, over approximately four years. And uh, that the payments would be uh, $202 million um, within 90 days of final approval of the court, and then $72 million a year on the anniversary of the first payment. So that's why I'm mm-hmm. saying approximately four years. Uh, what I can tell you is next month, the, the leadership team, um, uh, senior leaders, uh, finance committee representatives, we're going to be getting together with outside folks, um, financial experts. We're going to look at the finances of the association to figure out, you know, how exactly we're going to meet our financial obligation for uh, this settlement. And the settlement was part of an ability to pay, right? Um, it's what can we actually pay? And then be able to continue doing the operations of the business. Uh, will there be some change in the association? We don't know yet. Um, will there be some streamlining? I mean, probably, but we don't know yet. Uh, so we need to get through that process. And luckily, all I can say is we do have some time because uh, this final uh, approval isn't for at least six months. Um, but we're going to have to look at that and, and carefully say, where do we, where can we take from? Um, uh, and, but where can we where can we take from and how can we make sure that the association can continue to provide the, the resources, tools, programs and advocacy, advocacy that our members have come to expect. Um, so that's that's the financial piece. The um, rules piece, there's there's two of them. The first is that uh, they're, they're, we will have to implement a rule prohibiting the offer of cooperating compensation um, on the MLS. This is going to be. Um, this is going to be a, a big change for our members, where it was a, a clear and u- unilateral offer of compensation. Now, um, you know, but let me be clear, the offer of compensation is still allowed. 
It just right. can't be communicated <clears throat> on the MLS. So what does that mean? Okay, well, we might have to pick up the phone, call the other agent, call the other brokers. We, we're going to have to figure out a system of how we can, as efficiently as possible, uh, communicate if there are offers of compensation, um, You know, whether it's a text message, emails. Uh, you can, uh, as, a, as a brokerage, any of your listings, if you get an IDX feed from the MLS, you can post on that on your company website that you're offering cooperating compensation for your listings. You can't offer a uh, show anyone else's, but I mean, so we as realtors, what I do know is, is we adapt, we'll figure it out. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it, it'll be a little less efficient, but we'll figure it out. Um, I, right. I have confidence in that. And but, that was to appease the department of justice essentially, because they've been their statement of interest. They made it pretty clear that they want to see that. Decoupled. You know, the word they wanted decoupled. a complete decoupling. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. um, uh, and then the, uh, second rule change is that, uh, any MLS participant, uh, we're going to make a rule, a uh, rule that says any MLS participant working with a buyer must sign a written agreement in advance of touring any properties. And, and we didn't say a buyer rep agreement. We said any participant working with a buyer must sign a written agreement because there's some transactional brokerage states. Um, and so we, we, we allowed for the, uh, interesting. Yeah. The, we, we allowed for the, the, uh, state law has to prevail in all of these things. So, uh, to allow for the, the member, the, the licensee, the real estate professional to comply with state law while still having an agreement. And, and listen, at the end of the day, and I've been saying this for a couple of years now about encouraging folks to use um, uh, buyer brokerage agreements, uh, buyer rep agreements, whatever you want to call them. Um, when we can have additional conversation with the consumer explaining the value that we bring to the transaction sure. and clearly communicate how we're going to get paid, that's a good thing. Right. So that's that's yeah. a win. I will say that is a win, James. You used the word early, but that is a win. The more conversation we can have with the consumer, the better off everybody will be. Um, and, and then the other piece of that, you were asking about appeal as opposed to settlement. You know, yeah. one of the things- Because your and, approach was talking about that publicly, that you were going to appeal it to the end. So it yeah, was a shift. And so and for anybody that's been in litigation, they know settlement is always on the table, mm-hmm. but it's not something that, that we're going to necessarily promote, that we're having settlement conversations because can that un- will that undermine the case with but you know the there there were settlement conversations before the trial during the trial and obviously after the trial um uh, appeal what what i think what the the folks need to understand is we feel that we would have been successful on appeal um to overturn the jury verdict but it could have we could have been remanded back to the lower court for a new jury trial that's part right, of it right. The, the second part of it is if we went the appeal route um, um, and we could post the bond. Now, if we had to post the $5.4 billion, uh, the full bond, uh, the association wouldn't have the financial wherewithal to do that. And that would have created a whole different mechanism to, to do the appeal. But if we did the appeal, uh, that would have only protected the National Association of Realtors, not the well over a million members that we got uh, protected in the settlement, not the local state territory associations, not the association known MLSs that we got protected in the settlement. So during our appeal, which could have been up to two years, they still would have had to defend the copycat cases that have popped up across the country. And they would have been mm-hmm. on their own for that. So, Which um, means a lot of them would have gone bankrupt. Right. Pl- I'm not putting words in your mouth, but that's what that means essentially well, for the look, viewers if, and if listeners. If anyone, so. uh, it's, it just seems like, it's, I, I love our industry, but sometimes it just feels a little childish, right? Like, of course you have to say into a microphone, we're gonna fight this to the death because you are positioning your negotiation strength. These are Keith's words, not Kevin's, right? But of course you have to get on a microphone and say, yeah, we'll fight this as far and as hard as we need to so that while you are negotiating a settlement, you have as much leverage as possible. But that's like, that's 101 in Mm -hmm. how to approach legal negotiations. So if anyone is really uh, concerned or wondering about this, like just slow down and think and apply just a modicum of logic to the emotions that you feel. And pretty quickly, you'll get to the right answer. So, but Keith, I I think that we're, um, the dust is starting to settle. I think that we're finally getting more information out to uh, our members, the public, Mm -hmm. and some of that is happening. We need to do, continue to do a better job. Don't get me wrong. We have to keep pushing the information out. But uh, I think once the panic, the initial panic, um, kind of resolve people are realizing, well, okay, well, h- hold on a sec. Yeah. 
And some of these things are making making sense. So well, you- let me let me jump in real quick on okay. just two things because I, I think it's important to understand that when we talk about in any in any case you're never going to get everything you want. <laughs> it's just not how it works. Um, trust me, the the lawyers, the lawyers on the plaintiff's side got what they want, which was money, but the plaintiffs aren't going to get much of anything out of this. And so the what I'm getting at with it is the fact that NER was able to settle this for essentially every realtor member, some yeah. of the brokerages aren't covered in the settlement. And unfortunately, they'll have to figure that out as well. And that's that that's the not win part. But the fact that the membership is out and won't have to deal with repercussions, which, by the way, most people don't even know this, but the lawyers also didn't sue any of the agents and could have and gone down that road as well. And well, so and some, of, some of the copycat the cases, yeah. the, there there have been a few individuals a- and then agreed. some teams. But yeah, yeah. Okay. my point was yeah. it there could have been, been a lot that. bigger oh, yeah. is my yeah. point. And yeah. so, you know, everybody needs to, to realize, and I unfortunately have been sued and I have sued. Um, it is a very expensive, a very, it's expensive in either case. And for them to be out by being a member is is like pennies for what it could actually cost and I, and that's where i say it's a win from that perspective the fact that they're that you still can technically which is what i've been telling everybody to like calm down like you can still talk to a seller and you can still yeah. offer compensation to the yes. agent. Yes. you just can't do it on the mls there are wins in here there are things that aren't that aren't good and i feel um, unfortunately the 90 plus brokers who are, are still going to have to deal with this that sucks and i and that that's not the win column but the fact that that's there is is a great it's is pending it's still a proposed settlement it still has to be approved i want to be clear about all of that but the i think the smart move was the DOJ is likely out of the way. There's no scenario where Catchmark didn't talk to the DOJ ahead of time to make sure that this would be something that would be approved that the DOJ wouldn't, you know, intervene with. Um, and well, I, I think James, it gives people James, some let clarity. Just, let me just stop you. the The Department of Justice cannot prevent um, the settlement being approved because you guys are still in in litigation with each no, other. No, no, so. no, no, no. The Department of Justice, all they can do is offer an opinion. Now, the, okay. the, 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 the judge in Massachusetts, we know, was definitely interested in what the Department of Justice had to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so it, it was impact, impactful there. Um, I cannot speak to the Eighth Circuit um, of whether the, the judge would uh, be open to what the Department of Justice has to say or not, but it's at the discretion of the judge. And right. so if right. if the judge feels that even if the Department of Justice comes out and says something against the settlement, if the judge feels that this settlement is best for the plaintiffs um, and that that the, the defendants or the people that are making the settlement, um, you know, the rule changes are, are what they're supposed to be. The, the judge has complete discretion as to whether to approve it or not. Okay. So good. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying on that. Yeah. Um, uh, let's talk about Keith. Let's let, why don't you talk about yeah. the, the decoupling part? And I know you've had concerns around veterans and all of those yeah, let, components. Uh, think, thinking about these changes going forward. Right. Uh, and especially through the lens of political action and, and some of the, uh, candidly, the power that NAR has in Washington, while it may be less than it was, you know, a, a little bit ago, there still is, there still is a remnant of that power base there. How can we nudge the mortgage side of our industry into, because this is a potential affordability problem, definitely a problem on uh, on a veteran trying to get a loan. How can some of these solutions, can we collaborate with the other side of the aisle in our industry, the mortgage side, to find solutions and get the government to help and participate in that through political action? Yeah, no, that that's a great question, and and I will I will just say um, what's what's really fascinating for me about the political power that the National Association of Realtors um, has in Washington D.C. It's pointed out by our detractors and uh, the people that are our, our, our supporters. <laughs> There's so, one thing everyone I, agrees on. <laughs> I think I think that we still do have um, a very good influence, good influence in Washington, mm-hmm. but. You know, with regards to let's just uh, talk about uh, first time, first generation uh, buyers, um, you know, buyers uh, from different um, ethnic communities and then and then VA buyers. What they need to understand in the settlement 
offers of compensation can still be made. Hmm. And so they need to have their buyer rep check to see, you know, which properties are offering cooperating compensation um, because there will there will still be some. OK, um, now, if the property they want doesn't have it, then that poses a little bit of different problem or issue. But 18 kind states. Of, but sorry to well, sorry to interrupt, Kevin, but kind of it does. But there is nothing precluding. Yeah, is that where you were headed? That, that's what I was going to get at. So there are Go 18 states that currently have um, uh, written buyer brokerage agreements or contracts that are part of state law. So in 18 states, VA buyers have been working uh, <laughs> under these these guidelines. So it's, um, you know, most places allow for you to write into an offer that compensation will be paid, right? So for, for these um, potential buyers that can't come up with the money on their own, they can still try to make it part of negotiations, part of the contract if co cooperating compensation isn't being offered. But to your, your specific question about what are we doing in Washington, D.C., you know, it took us decades for us to get the rules, guidelines, laws that we have in place now. I just have to, to be very, very clear. We're not going to change it overnight in the next month, probably not in the next year. But mm -hmm. we're definitely having the conversations. I can tell you that we sent a letter to the VA urging them to change their rules. Um, we sent a letter to uh, HUD with the Mortgage Bankers Association. And actually, I'm just going to pull up the letter. We got a response from HUD saying that um, if, and, and I'm looking at it now, in case in case you can see my head moving around. Yeah. <laughs> the FHA policy, if sellers continue to pay buyer side real estate agent commissions and fees as a manner of state and local law or custom, and if the commissions and fees are reasonable in amount, existing policy would not treat those payments as interested party contributions, provided all other requirements are set. And I have a letter that was sent to me just the other day uh, and to NAR, uh, March 29th, it's dated, by Julia R. Gordon, Assistant Secretary of Housing, Federal Housing Commissioner. So at least we know through HUD, FHA, Fannie, Freddie, all that stuff, buyer rep, um, uh, co cooperating compensation that's paid at the closing and it's listed on all the documentation will not be treated any other way against them being able to get other interested party contributions for closing costs, repairs, or any of that stuff. So that's the good news. But just know we are continuing our conversation. We're looking at what we can do in bite-sized chunks, mm -hmm. uh, uh, James, because I know that's your concern. You want you want us to to Turn on the no, the not at all. I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not naive to the fact this takes time. I just what I'm. What I think is important is that information is is shared as widely as possible. And so I got a copy of the letter and I shared it online. So people saw. It and everyone's like, "Oh, I had no idea." And that gets back to the point of we have to just we have to get a much 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 better system of disseminating that info because yeah. then the detractors who genuinely think they can set up a structure like this again this is completely naive um understand that this the the working those relationships and, and being able to talk to you know the head of hud and all that that, that comes from tenure <laughs> right and and you know and, and being in the space for a long time which is why you know i have critics as well who are like why do you keep supporting any arcs like because i'm not naive to think that this industry would look the same without them like right. there's a process yeah. here do things you, need you to know, change of course but and, and, and James, you know what? And, and we all know this. You know, there's another group that's saying, hey, we're going to form an association. And um, one of the things that um, that that I, I actually love about that, um, that thought process is, I mean, first of all, I don't think they'd be able to compete with us and, and just the advocacy alone. But competition makes us better on a sure. daily basis. We're interacting with our competitors and it makes us better. And so any opportunity for us to get better. I welcome it and, and, and competition makes us better. Um, but hey, Keith, just one other thing. You talked about um, uh, how folks have used um, uh, realtors, real estate agents, real estate professionals and are satisfied with them. Uh, Tim Herr, one of our liaisons this year, just got a letter to the editor published to Forbes magazine talking about how over 90% of consumers are happy, uh, used a, a, a real estate professional, are happy that they did. And so, you know, we are, we are, he's one of our surrogates. We're getting the information out. So yeah, yeah take a look for, uh, for that Forbes um, uh, letter. Okay. We'll take a look. We, we got one last question before you got to go. I know you got a hard stop. Um, and where do you want to, where does NER go in the, in the future? And like, where does it, what does it look like in your opinion? Is it smaller? Is it focused on different things? I've had this crazy idea, which I'll float and you're going to hate me for it. But like, what if NER also allowed homeowners to be part of the association? Like if there was a shift in it, like, what do you think this looks like 
over the next, you know, in the future? Where do you where do you think it goes? Yeah, well, you know what? And we're, don't we're say the same as what it is, by the way, or I'm going to get we're, upset. We're, we're actually engaging, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're actually engaging um, uh, American Homeowners, American Property Owners Alliance, APOA. Uh, we've got over 10 million uh, property owners who we're engaged with on a regular basis, talking to them about um, uh, their rights as, as property owners and the importance of property ownership. So we are engaging consumers. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I'd never thought of uh, allowing other folks in as a, a, a member. Uh, I guess it would have to be an affiliate member, right? Because uh, let's see, we need a real estate license in order to be a realtor, but hey, th that's an idea. But, but, but maybe you know, there's... But maybe there's something there about how you're how how you do advocacy and who you are advocating yeah. for could shift. I mean, imagine so, as a homeowner spends X amount of dollars per year to make sure that their their property rights are being focused. So, I know it's so crazy, James, but. I know I know you're prolific when it comes to um, reading uh, things, watching videos. In in the video that um, I did with Katie Johnson, where we announced the settlement, I talked about Watch forming it. a task, watching forming a task force of folks both inside the industry and outside. And so, you know, maybe that's something we throw out to them, say, hey, all right, we've got different experts uh, that care about real estate that we're going to have on this task force. Is this something we should look at? Um, but, you know, I, I want to go back to um, when you guys were asking about what my tenure will be as president um, and how I said that we've got a long runway. Uh, I've got a long runway, you know, through 2025. Um, and, you know, what what are we going to look like? Um, when I when I was speaking with Jack Miller, because um, he and I hadn't really met each other, we we had a, a an hour long Zoom uh, about a month and a half, two months ago, and we were just talking about things. He says, Kevin, he says, you know, other presidents have done their things, uh, and and they've been peacetime presidents. You're a wartime president. And I said, <laughs> oh, I said that that's an interesting way to look at it because mm -hmm. of all the different crises that have been going on. Um, my goal over the next uh, year and you know seven eight months at this point is to get us through our uh, immediate um, uh, set of circumstances um, out into the calmer waters and, and have the association in a better position. Anytime I, I, I do a job, I always want to leave whatever I did in a better spot than I found it. So that's going to be my goal. What is our association going to look like, James? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, I think I'll have a better idea in, in a few months as we're going through the financial stuff. Um, will, will it be a, a streamlined possibly? You know, we talked about the governance that, that we have and, and how we're at where we are now. Is that going to have to change? Well, there's some folks saying that it has to. And I know that, that you've uh, mentioned that a couple of times as well. So all I can say is everything is on the table. Um, we're going to be. That's a look fair answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great we're, answer. We're we're going to be looking at it all, but yep. but when 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 I leave uh, the the role as president of the National Association of Realtors, I want to be able to look back and say we are in a better spot today than when I took over on January eighth, twenty twenty four. The only thing that I would add is, if if you keep doing what you're doing with political action, and then level up internal and external communication, like that is a massive it's win solve problems mm -hmm. compared to i mean james i like your interesting idea i could bring up my hundred year <laughs> oh it's a idea. horrible idea i but just like throwing like, your shit out yeah i mean you know it's interesting <laughs> but to back to your sort of get back Keith's to basics, great idea by the way was hundred year mortgages it is a great <laughs> idea it's it's a wonderful idea it solves more I, problems than so, your idea so I, I but, got, i've got to tell you my my father my father uh, god rest his soul he uh he he shared with me um very early on in my career what his uh version of a, 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 a eternal optimist was so what's that dad he had a 92 year old client buying a house that went into the bank looking for a 30-year mortgage he, See, he says and that's he, me. he believes he believes he's going to pay off, make the final <laughs> payment on that mortgage. He's yeah. the eternal optimist. That's funny. Either that's way, funny. At some point in the next thirty years or less, he's not worried about that mortgage anymore. So yeah, either way, funny. he wins. Well, hey, fellas, listen. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on with you today. Uh, unfortunately, we've come up to the time where yep. I, I need to hop off and totally get yep. it. Thanks get for being here, next, Kevin. Yeah, Bye. thanks. We Kevin. look forward to having you back. Good. Keep up the good work, and remember, yeah. you have a two-year term. You get to push the envelope. So yeah. all right. <laughs> All right, my friend. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Will subscribing to this podcast save the real estate industry as we know it? Yes, it absolutely will. Subscribe now and you'll be able to find out if I'm right.